Welcome to Liner Notes. My name is David Bixler. This month, we join in congratulating pianist Luis Perdomo for his recent Grammy Award for El Arte del Bolero Volume 2 in the category of Best Latin Jazz Album. In this episode of Liner Notes, Luis recounts the musical journey from his native Venezuela and then coming to New York initially to study before transitioning into one of the most in-demand pianists on the scene, gracing the bandstand with musicians such as Robbie Coltrane, Tom Harrell, and his longtime musical partner, Miguel Zanon. Luis, good afternoon. Glad you could join us on Liner Notes. Good to see you. Congratulations for the recently won Grammy, man. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, David, and thank you for having me uh, in the podcast. Yeah, uh, the Grammy, th thanks a lot. Um, it, it was very uh, unexpected and a happy surprise. I wasn't really thinking that it was going to win. So <laughs> I didn't even go to the ceremony. I just had a gig. So I'm like, well, you know, let me just do go do, do my gig, you know. Well, the gig's the sure thing, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting with the Grammys, man. I mean, I think it's fantastic. And I want to get your take on it because with musicians, you know, sometimes there's the you know, the thought, okay, this is just a popularity contest and, you know, right, sometimes right. you're surprised at music that wins. But, uh, like, what's your kind of philosophy behind this? And, like, hopefully you guys can use this to, uh, you know, turn this in to something cool, you know, as far as, because, you know, it, it carries some, uh, you know, gravitas and, uh, you know, people take this very seriously. Do you have, like, plans to, uh, you know, turn on this and, and make it happen? When we make music, uh, we're not really thinking of winning any awards or anything. We're just trying to focus on the craft and just try to, you know, convey into the recording our ideas and hopefully the public will get it. You know, you get so involved in that process and uh, you're not really thinking of uh, you know, awards or that kind of thing, you know, and um Throughout the years, I've been, you know, nominated. Only with Miguel, we've been nominated, you know, with the quartet, uh, I think like six times. And then the Arte del Bolero, I got nominated for two Grammys, one Latin Grammy and one um, uh, the American Grammy. And then, you know, this latest nomination that won the uh, Best Latin Jazz album. So only with Miguel, it's been at least nine times. And with other projects, probably more than 20 times, you know. And um, so I didn't really think up too much about it, you know. Mm -hmm. But I got to tell you, um, I'll, I'll be lying if I tell you, yeah, I don't care about, you know, th those uh, awards and that kind of thing, you know. Because it's actually nice to be recognized, you know. Of and, course. And it, it definitely helps, you know. Yeah, I, I know that 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 um, prize doesn't award doesn't come with any um, money involved, but the money comes in different ways, you know. If you play your cards right, sure, it's a, it's a different currency, and you know I got to say that you know well deserved, thoroughly enjoyed the recording. You know, it's interesting because Miguel was on the podcast when the first one came out, when uh, Volume One came out. And so, you know, and he told me, if I remember correctly, it was like a streaming gig from the gallery and that you turn, was that, do I have that right? Yeah, yeah. The the, the first uh, Arte del Bolero that we recorded, it was just for fun. It wasn't intended to be a recording. We just did it to put it on YouTube. And um, we didn't even rehearse. We just spoke about the music. And some of the music we had played with the quartet, Normally, we play some of those tunes as a, as an encore. You know, after we play all the um, uh, Miguel's music, then we just play one of these songs that is just, you know, very natural and easy listening, you know, to send the people home, you know, on a peaceful note. Um, so we have played some of those songs. That music I've heard um, since I remember ever listening to music. You know, I grew up with that, uh, with all those songs, uh, growing up in Caracas, Venezuela, where I'm from. And um, a lot of the times I didn't even know this, the, the song. Um, uh, I, I didn't know how to play the song on the piano, but I heard it so many times, so many times that, you know, at the you know, when it, it was time for me to play it, it's like, oh, okay, cool. You know, like I kind of got it, you know. Part of your fabric. Being, 
yeah, 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 without the, the, the need to listen to a recording or anything. It's just from like memory. It's like, okay, I think it goes this way, this way. And then if I had like little details that I would go back to the recording or I would ask Miguel what he would like to do, you know. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, basically that that's how that went. So we were doing a, a streaming recording at the Jazz Gallery for an organization. And we had some free time in the back of the, uh, um, when we finished the uh, the the recording so miguel was like yeah let, let's just record some boleros and um we just basically just did one take of everything you know we just recorded the whole thing there are some little mistakes in there that we just left them you know it's like you know and um i i got a call from miguel several days later and uh he told me man listen to the recording it sounds pretty good so i listened to it and I was like, man, it sounds great. Uh, so Miguel was like, man, like, we, we should put it out. Like, should, should we put it on? I was like, sure, I don't care. Just put it out, you know. And uh, yeah, and that, yeah. next thing, he got nominated for two Grammys and all that stuff. And, you know, there was all this talk about it. But I think actually what people like about that recording is that it, it kind of captured... Uh, you know, that kind of like in um, when you go to a jazz club and the band already f finished playing and then people are hanging at the bar the musicians are just hanging and they're cleaning and then somebody jumps on the piano and they, they start playing like kind of like a very relaxed atmosphere you know and i think that's what people really like about that you know plus the fact that it's music that is very popular in especially in south america yeah you know you spoke about your relationship with miguel you know playing in his quartet a lot of really intricate and complicated music and then uh going into these well you know and i am not diminishing the uh the depth of this but you know it calls for a different thing and maybe speak you know if there's uh, any pianist listening like your role in this record in the duo you know there's a lot more counterpoint you have a different but you have different spaces to film is that something organic, something that you needed to think about or just something like just part of you, who you are as a musician? Yeah, and basically that's part of like how I um, hear music also. This is very funny, but um, when I was a student in Venezuela, I had a teacher named Jerry Whale. He was an Austrian, um, uh, or he is an Austrian because he's still alive and very much active. Um, Immigrant. Well, I don't want to use that word, immigrant. He came from Austria <laughs> at it the end of the like, war. When you said his name, he didn't sound like he was Venezuelan to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, so his actual name is Gerhard Wilhelm. <laughs> and he's say well, the main or the, or the main um, jazz teacher in Venezuela. So, you know, uh, I started um, studying with him when I was 10. And uh, so, you know, he kind of like got my mind when he was very open. And I think like the biggest um, lesson that I got from him was just to be open to all kinds of music, listen to all kinds of music. Don't have any borders like, okay, this style or this style or this style. Listen to all kinds of music. So even though sometimes I listen to music that I don't like, I give it a chance. And I might listen to it, I don't know, two or three years, four years from, from you know, from now. And I, I might like it. I might still not like it, but I'm open, you know. Um, so uh, that's basically um, the approach that I took with the duo. Just let it flow naturally, you know. So I was just thinking of, um, you know, like my days in Venezuela. You know, like just going to to the beach, that kind of peaceful, you know, and no soul trying to impress or like, you know, there was no that um, uh, pressure of you got to hit all these notes. You know, I, I would just go for it. If it works, it works. You know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, you know. But, um, you know, basically that that that's what it was, at least from, from my point of view. You know, it was very, very much just uh, carefree, you know. Do you guys do some uh, concertizing like this? Probably now you will be, but you know, has that been part of the thing in uh, the past? Just duo. Yeah, we we have been on the road like in these past years with this project. 
And um, it's very funny because it kind of freaks out uh, some of the engineer and the sound, the, the, the sound people. Because we're used to get there very early to do a sound check and then we rehearse, you know, with the quartet or with any other band that I play with. But with this band, basically, we just show up. So we were showing up to the gigs, you know, like 45 minutes before. And people were like freaking out, like, oh my God, like, where were you guys? Like, what do you need? Like, the people are outside, like, waiting, you know? So it's like, man, you know, it's just, I just go to the piano, like, I play a couple of notes, I adjust the bench, open the lid. Okay, cool, we're ready. Miguel just like puts the, the mouthpiece on the saxophone. Okay, we're good. We're good to play like in five minutes, you know? <laughs> no, that, that's cool. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions I want to ask you about uh, repertoire. I, I read someplace, the first recording you just played, you know, as you said, it was really impromptu, but second recording you uh, deliberated about what you were going to play. And then I, I noticed that the tracks, two of them are Venezuelan. It looks like you maybe got the uh, short end of the stick there, but uh, maybe go into uh, like how some of that happened. And also Caballo Viejo, the end, like that tag, it reminds me of, I had this Keith Jarrett recording. Yeah, it comes um, from there. It, it does. Oh, okay. All yeah, right. Basically, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, Super bad, man. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. So maybe talk about that process, you know, like how were these these tunes selected? Yeah, well, for, for this, um, the second project, um, what we tried to do was just um, find composers from the whole diaspora, not only Cuban or... Well, I, I think that the first recording, like mo most of the music was written by Cuban composers. So we were just trying to spread it out a little bit more because there are so many beautiful songs that come from composers from Mexico, from Colombia, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Argentina, you know, so we just try to spread it out a, a little bit more. Um, and um, yeah, the, the song Caballo Viejo is, is one of the most famous songs uh, that has come out from the Venezuelan songbook. And um, yeah, Miguel just wanted to record that one, so I'm like, all right, cool. So I, I know that that's another one of the songs that I have never played, I think. But I just sat at the piano and I was just like, okay, that that's how it goes, you know. Like I've heard that song so many times, you know. Um, and yeah, in the uh, at the very end, he where he told me to um, play that tag that comes out of the Keith Jarrett recording, specifically, I think it comes from Standards Volume Two. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the song is uh, Moon and Sand. Uh, I think that's how they, they, they finished the song, you know, with this little tag. And for me, it was very special because that was the first recording of Keith Jarrett that I ever bought. That was my introduction to Keith Jarrett, Standards Volume 2. So when he told me that, I was like, I think I never told him that, but, you know, that that's actually my first um, recording uh, of Keith. And I listened to our recording so much because it was the only one that I had of Keith. At the beginning, I was like a little uh, thrown aback by the uh, complexity of, you know, like the way that Jack DeJohnette played. But then, you know, as I listened and listened and listened and listened more, it just became like, man, this is perfect music, you know. Even all the... Uh, um, the background vocalizing that uh, Keith uh, does, it, it, it just became part of the music. 
So, yeah, so, you know, every time that we put that little tag in uh, at the end of Caballo Viejo, it's like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, it sounded great. All right. It took me a minute to run, man, I know this. And, you know, it's uh, yeah, very, yeah, very yeah, yeah. cool. Well, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, you know, I think one of the things is um, I see that you're teaching at Berkeley, so, you know, you wear that hat also. And I think one of the things that we that we learn as musicians and that we teach our students is, like, how to program a set, right? So with this recording... You know, this might be something that you would caution a student against doing. You know, there's kind of like the same vibe, maybe a lot of similar tempos, and, you know, obviously not detrimental in this case because the music shines. But, like, how how did you, I mean, were you aware of this? Like, okay, we have to do, I mean, I guess the last tune is kind of different vibe. The uh, Silencio, you know, has a kind of... right. You know, a different thing. But uh, were you aware of this? Okay, the, like, how are we going to, like, bring something different to all the tunes? Or maybe it was just a case of letting your musicianship shape the tunes as they were. Yeah, um, I, I guess for the second recording, we um, we put a little bit more thought about that. Um, yeah, I was definitely thinking, okay, like, a lot of the tunes are, like, you know, like, the same tempo. But at the same time, that comes into the fact that we weren't really thinking about even we weren't thinking about like the public. It was just we just put the music there and then put it out there, you know. So especially for the first recording, I don't think we were thinking about like, you know, like the tempos or like all all these songs and boleros or anything. It was just beautiful music, you know. So yeah, we just, we just left it like that. But for the second recording, yeah, we took like for example the song Paula C, uh written by um Ruben Blade. It's a salsa song, which is, you know, a, a little faster. Uh, so it's like, okay, wait, we can do um, Paula Sen. And plus, I'd been, uh, I had been playing that tune with my trio. Um, so it's like, yeah, you, you know, let, 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 let's do that one. You know, it, it'll be a little uh, different from the uh, bolero or ballad, you know. brought in uh, Silencio, which is uh, also different. I think there's another song that Miguel came came up with this arrangement, more like kind of like open, like Coltrane-ish, uh, a little bit, um, and that it goes like a little bit more freer, you know. Um, so yeah, we we try to do that, and then when we um, he's programming, basically Miguel is the one that you know the the brain um, uh, behind this operation, you know. And I'm you know I'm happy about that. I'm like yeah, yeah, yeah. take the 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 order of the songs, you know. I don't know, for some reason, I kind of like just to be like in the background, you know. Um, 
So basically, but he asked me, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? About this, you know, uh, when we're talking about the repertoire, sometimes we put like um, a major sounding song, you know, like a major key and then a minor key, a major key, minor key. So we, we, we try not to put too many songs that are minor or major, you know, the key, just to like change the vibe a little bit. And, and I guess that's it, you know, like basically just, I guess for this project, if you start thinking too much or like um, preparing too much, then it's going to kind of like kill the vibe. You know, we just play. <laughs> right. So I want to, uh, you had alluded to uh, your piano teacher in Caracas. And I want to talk a little bit about your development. You you came to New York and uh, went to uh, MSM. Um, was, was your, was your um, just a little bit uh, about the, the the thought behind that did you know that you wanted to get to New York and this was a way to do it or did you want to go to school here or a combination of the two yeah I think it was a combination I I wanted to come to basically uh, around the time that I was um I don't know 17 or 18 um well let, let me uh, back up a little bit around the time that I was 18 I got a gig in which at the time, was Caracas' most famous jazz club. Uh, it's called Juan Sebastian Bar, you know, as opposed to Johann Sebastian Bach. It's Juan Sebastian Bar, you know. Um, so I used to play there from Monday to Saturdays, from 9.30 p.m. to 3.30 a.m. It was a regular gig. And, you know, I was very lucky to get that gig, you know, right out of high, high school. Um, but around that time... Also, all the friends that were playing at, at the same club that were telling me, said, man, you, we, we need to go to New York. Like, you should move to New York. Also, musicians that came from every part of the world, they, you know, they used to tell me, said, man, you should go to New York. Or you, should, you, should, you should leave. You should go somewhere else. You know? So I, at some point, I was thinking either going to Europe, to Paris specifically. Uh, I had seen... Also, this is back in when Venezuela was actually a cool country. <laughs> there was a jazz TV show every Sunday. And at, at some point, I think they had some, some sort of um, deal with the uh, French embassy for like three months. So they got all these videos from music, uh, like French videos, you know, or like European videos, you know, or with, or, or with uh, videos with French musicians, you know. So one time I saw this video of um, a, a, sax, a French sax, Michel Portal, and uh, playing with Joaquin Kuhn, the German pianist on piano, Jean Francois, Jenny Clark on bass, and Daniel Humer uh, on drums. And that, you know, that was like, wow. You know? And um, at that point, I was also very much into free music. I was listening to Cecil Taylor and, and that, kind of, that kind of thing. So I was just like, wow, that, that's the kind of music they're doing in Europe. So I started thinking of possibly uh, finding something in uh, going to study in Paris, you know. Uh, but that didn't happen. I ended up like coming to New York with some friends just to, um, um, you know, just listen to music and see you know, like how things were here. Then I came back by myself the next year. And uh, I went to a friend of ours that lives in New York and uh, he's a saxophone player his name is Rolando Riseño he used to play with uh, Tito Puente and oh, I know uh, Rolando Gidon. back in the day yeah, yeah man yeah. yeah 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 so at uh, some point Rolando was like yeah man like, you should audition to the Manhattan School of Music because he had gone there and it was very close to where he lived on the Upper West Side so I'm like sharp uh, so I went with Rolando, went with Rolando. At that time, I didn't speak any English. So Rolando was like my translator. So we go to the school, and it happened that that week they were doing auditions. I remember it was in May. They were doing auditions. So we fill out the forms, and um, I did an audition. Next thing, they sent me a letter uh, saying that I was accepted and scholarship. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. I guess it's time to go, you know. So I ended up moving to New York, and um, uh, eventually, uh, originally I wanted to be here, learn, you know, like the culture, learn English. Um, 
be a part of the uh, community, you know, like hang out with musicians, and, you know, that, that kind of thing, and, and eventually go back, you know, out, or be either spend like some time in Caracas, some time in New York. But, you know, things develop in a different way that I was thinking. <laughs> and that's, you know, it's going on 31 years living in New York, you know. Actually, I've lived in the States more than I actually lived in Venezuela at this point, because I left when I was 22. So, you know, I kind of feel more at home here than, than there. But, um, but yeah, that's kind of like how it happened. You know, it's just very, you know, um, so some things I planned, some other things I didn't plan. So I just went with the, with the punches, you know. <laughs> then the next thing I want to ask, I've read about on your website, you then pursued a master's degree at Queens College. And I have heard, you're not the, the first person I've heard life-changing stories from Sir Roland Hanna. And oh, yeah. You, you, yeah, have, yeah, yeah. you have a quote that I pulled from your website and where you say, I began to look at jazz and classical music in a new and more in-depth way, and my playing evolved accordingly. And just curious if uh, you can give us some details about like what he did and what these changes were that impacted your playing. Well, you know, when I first came to New York, um, my teacher at the Manhattan School of Music was uh, Harold Danko. He's an amazing pianist. He was the uh, at some point he was the jazz uh, the head of the jazz department at the Eastman uh, College uh, College of Music, I think. And um, Harold was another you know so somebody who basically blew my mind with all the knowledge. And when I first heard him play, I was like, man, that's how it's supposed to sound. You know, that's how jazz is supposed to sound. So I, I would just say, wow. Um, and Harold also, he kind of like opened my mind towards like listen to different um, musicians and different pianists and um, go back to the roots of the music. So at some point, um, C. Roland Hanna was a guest with the uh, jazz orchestra at, Ma at Manhattan School of Music. So Harold told me, he said, man, like, go check out uh, Roland, you know. So I did. And, you know, I saw Ronan playing with the big band. It was great. It was super swinging. But then he played two songs, uh, piano solo, that just basically blew me away. And that was something that I had been working on with, with Harold. It's just um, sound, you know, tone production, um, which I never knew that you could basically have a sound with a piano. I just thought that the piano said, you know, you just play it and it sounds. And everybody sounds kind of like the same. But uh, he was like, no, 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 no. Like, go check out the Roland, and you see what I'm talking about. <laughs> and yeah, when when Roland started playing, it, it, in a way, he sounded like fuller than with the with the uh, than with the big band, you know. Even though the, of course, the sound was softer because it's only the piano. But like, just the way he was playing, it sounded like so like it filled up the room, you know. I was like, man, I wanna learn that how to play like that, you know. So when I finished uh, my uh, degree at um, at the Manhattan School of Music, I think by day Harold left because he got a, a the position at Eastman. So I was gonna go for composition at the Manhattan School of Music, but then the teacher that I wanted to study, he also left. He took another position somewhere else. So I'm like, oh man, like everybody that I wanted to to study with, they left. So I started looking for other possibilities, and I went to Queens College. And I saw that he was in, uh, Roland, uh, see, Roland Hanna was part of the faculty. So I'm like, oh, wow, like, let me see. So I went over there and I, you know, uh, so like, um, I went looking for information, you know. And then they told me, yeah, you know, Roland is actually here. So you want to go audition and you, you know, at that point you could come in, I think in the winter um, or, or what they call it, not the winter, the uh, spring. Uh, semester in, like in 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 January, so I went and I actually met Roland, and he was like, "Man, like, yeah, play something for me." And uh, I played. I forget what it, what I played at the time. I was like, "Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You cool. You know." He was like, "Yeah, you know, just fill out the papers and you know, like we start right away." So I'm like, "All right, cool." Also, um, Queens College was very affordable still is yeah. so I'm like alright cool great so I started um, taking lessons with Roland so basically 
um when i said that he um made me look at the piano in a in a different way it's because at that point i was kind of like i wasn't that cocky you know but i knew that i could play you know like I, you know i could make a, a living as a pianist so uh my first lesson uh, ronan told me okay play a ballad and i think uh, i chose to play i fall in love too easily which is a ballad that i, I knew very well so ronan was like okay do you do you know the lyrics and i by chance i actually knew the lyrics so i'm like okay because i i I was listening to Chet Baker with Harold Dankel, and he sings that song, you know, so I'm like, yeah, I know the lyrics. Um, so he, but right when I was about to play, he was like, okay, we're playing, I forget, A flat. And then when you're going to play the solo, modulate to E, and then play the last melody in D flat. So I was just like, okay, well, uh, I know it in this key. I so, said, well, if you don't know it in this, those are the keys, you don't know the song. So I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> so basically, that was the beginning. So um, we started working, basically just transposing songs. And, you know, so what he wanted to do was just focus on all the great areas that I had. Areas that I was like, eh, I'm not really clear, but I was kind of like, you know, like making it work, but it wasn't really clear. That's what he wanted to focus on. So he made me go back, you know, like over my steps and like, okay, let's go back to your scales. Let's go back to, to the beginning, basically. And let's make sure that everything is, is in place. Let's go back to, um, uh, stride piano. And the whole time that I was, um, taking lessons from him, we were working on, um, on the music of Scott Joplin, you know, so you always, that was part of the, that was part of the, the, the lessons, you know, like make sure that the stride piano was there. Even though at, at, the, um, at this point, I don't really play that kind of music, but I have the knowledge, you know, like I want to practice a little bit, but I have the knowledge if, if I need to do a concert playing um, stride piano, you know. Um, so yeah, basically that that's what it was. He just made me go back to the beginning and like just clear out every, every great area. Another thing that he did now that you also mentioned the teaching part, was that he kept telling me, he said, you, you need to get a student. And I was getting mad because, I, you know, to me at that point, it, it, it was like, um, I used to think of, well, I mean, this is going to sound a little, a little bit bad, but I used to think of like people that just teach. He said, well, it's because they cannot play. You know? So I'm like, no, man, I want to play. I want to be on stage. I want to be, I don't want to be teaching. But later, I understood what he was trying to do. He said, when you get a student and you got to explain what you do to a student, it further makes you clear out your knowledge. You know, because at some point, the students were asking me, like, okay, how do you do this? And I'm like, oh, well, okay, um, I know how to do it, but I don't know how to explain it. Then we just try to start figuring out what is it that you do, you further uh, uh, clear out things that you should be doing or not should be doing, you know, so it, it, it really helps also, you know, that way, you know, having students. I don't know if this is opening up a can of worms, but uh, you spoke <laughs> about your, your, your gig in Caracas, and I assume you probably still have family there and friends. Uh, what's, yeah. is there, are cats playing? Is there a scene at all? I mean, I know that's probably low on the totem pole when, when people are just trying to survive. But what do you hear from right. musicians um, back in Venezuela? Well, I'm, you know, a lot of the musicians that are, you know, um, a lot of my friends down there, they say that, you know, the situation is, is bad. But I don't know, I, for some reason, they say that, it, that there is work, but the situation is bad. So I'm, like, I'm trying to understand, well, what do you mean that there's work, but the, the situation is bad? That sounds like New York, man. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. then you have all these concerts down there, packed concerts of like um, po popular artists, and the tickets are like two hundred, three hundred, four hundred dollars. So it's like, mean, like, wh where are people like getting all this money to go to this concert? But at the same time, like I have some of the friends I mean, like I'm not really playing that much, and like trying to give lessons, so. You know, and, and I haven't been, truly, I haven't been there in 12 years. 
So I, I, I will have to go down there and spend some time to really understand the situation, you know. But I mean, it cannot be that good with all the people leaving, you know, there's tons of people leaving right now, you know, what otherwise used to be a pretty cool country, you know. When I was there, I was lucky, like extremely lucky that because, you know, like we live, um, Venezuela is located right next to Brazil. So at that time, Venezuela was doing good. So there were so many Brazilian musicians in Caracas. So you, I could just go like from my gig, I could just go like a block away and hear authentic Brazilian music, you know, and those guys were my friends. I mean, I would just go and play my set and then in between sets, I would just go to the other club and I'd listen to Brazilian music. Then, you know, like you will be playing. And then I remember like at uh, one of the first um, months at the beginning that I was playing in this club, I see a really tall guy walk in, you know, dressed in white. So I'm like, okay, cool. Then I see more people coming in with instruments. So I'm like, oh, wow. So I, I started looking at the really tall guy because, you know, he stood up and, and in the place. Like he's, he, he was, you know, and I realized, man, that looks like Chucho Valdez. It's like, oh man, like, oh man, that's Ira Carey. Yeah, like the whole Ira Carey came, you know. <laughs> Whoa. And they hung out. They used to, they used to all, all, always come to that club and hang out and play with us, you know, like I met all those guys. I basically played with all of them there, you know. And Chucho Valdez, to this day, I'm friends with him and he remembers. So yeah, man, of course, you know. And he sat right next to the piano. So, you know, I'm playing, and I'm like, oh, man, like, just what this is there. <laughs> so a lot of Cuban musicians used to come. Uh -huh. In addition to Brazilian musicians, like Cuban musicians, like um, uh, the great Emiliano Salvador, uh, the pianist I met in Venezuela, um, Gonzalo Rubalcaba, like so many of them, so many of them. Uh, so it was great, you, you know, because the relationship at that time between Venezuela and Cuba was good, you know also between Venezuela and the States. So you still get all these people that were doing the, um, I think the, the, the jazz ambassadors, you know, that from the state department, they go up different places. So Venezuela was a place that they used to go all the time. And down there, I think I saw one time, um, I, I saw a Bob Berg quartet and I think they were doing a state department tour. So, at night, you know, like I've been playing the gig and all of a sudden I see the bass player, James Genus. He, you know, he came to the gig and then Dave Kikowski. I'm like, oh, man, those are the guys from like Bob Berg. And they, same thing, they played all night, you know, so I was just sitting there like listening, you know, listening to those guys. A lot of musicians from Europe used to come there. So, so it was great at that time. I'm talking, you know, by the time that I got interested in music and uh, that I, I, I was actually, you know, like going around by myself. I was pretty young. I would say probably 13, 14. And I was already, you know, just, okay, I'm, I'm going to this concert. So mid eighties, you know, so it, it was actually really great. The music scene down there, you know, I don't know what it is right now, but back then it was really nice. You know? Before I let you go, you uh, are quite busy, especially with Miguel. And but then as a sideman with a lot of other projects, it's been a minute since uh, you've had your own record as leader. You alluded to something was coming out later this year. Why don't you just talk a little bit about what we can be looking forward to from you? Yeah, well, um, I'm planning on doing another recording with my group, the Controlling Ear Unit, uh, which is a, a basically a trio, but it could be anything else. So um, I, I, I just don't want to call it a trio because it's not only going to be a trio. It just depends, you know. Um, but basically, uh, that there's another uh, there's another uh, project that I want to record. I'm right now I'm like writing the music, so all that stuff is gonna come out at the end of the uh, the year. Also, I want to do another solo piano record. You know, I did one a few years ago, and uh, I think that my play has you know evolved uh, a little bit more in that set, in that way. You know, like solo piano. So I would like to do another uh, solo piano recording. Um, so basically those two uh, projects, you know, like probably at the end of the year, uh, I think they're going to come out like pretty close to each other. So look forward yeah, to hearing this, Basically man. that's what yeah. I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Well, Luis, I thank you for your time and thanks for the music. And again, congratulations on the Grammy. People check out the recording. 
El Arte del Bolero, I'm not very self-conscious as I try to pronounce that. Uh, volume oh, two. Oh, no, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> All, All the, the best, best, man. Thank you so much, David. I, again, thank you so much for uh, having me on the show. Uh, my, my pleasure, bro. My pleasure. Liner Notes is grateful for the support of Van Doren Reads and Mouthpieces. Be sure and check out the Van Doren Advisory Studio in New York City for all your sound sculpting needs. Liner Notes is grateful for the support of Arlen's Good Beer in Bowling Green, Ohio. Engineered by Marco Mendoza. Visit his website at engineeredbymarco.com. The theme music is No FOMO MoFo by yours truly. Produced by David Bixler. Be sure and subscribe to Liner Notes wherever you find your podcasts. If you like what you hear, I ask that you consider supporting Liner Notes financially. You can do this by going to the Liner Notes tab at davidbixler.com. Thank you for your consideration. <laughs>